Okay, Dan, anything before we turn it over to Dom? No, we want to turn it over to Dom. And, All right. And get started. And we're going to talk about service projects. But more importantly, we're going to talk about how you create a service project. Um, service projects are, are different from, if you will, a grants program in that uh, the grant programs that uh, we talked about with the foundation may not be in your club's territory. Uh, but the service projects, when you talk about those and put them in that perspective, they're, they're local, they're in your community. They're projects that are used to improve the community uh, or, or or other portions of the community. So, so where do you start? Uh, who's got some ideas of how you start looking at what project your club is going to get involved in? Let's say you got appointed now as the uh, club project uh, director. What, what are you gonna do to get things started? Go ahead, Donna. Hi, Dominic. I think I would um, put a pulse on what interest uh, members have. That's, I think, my first step. Okay. That's a possible start. Okay, John, you got one? Uh, challenge the members to come up with projects. Have them look around and say, what needs to be done? Where can we help? What can be done where? In the community. In the community. Okay, have you thought about the idea of asking the community what it wants? Well, that's part of this, my satellite club. I've got uh, people who are, well, one's the executive director of the Friends of the Bosque and, one, and the president. And so I asked them, what can we do for you? And so our service project next Saturday is uh, to clean out the cactus garden, Arboretum. All right. Uh, those of you that are in a small community, what ideas do you, do you have about finding out what the community needs? How about talking to the mayor? <clears throat> or, or, or if you've got that kind of government, how about the city manager? I think it was already said once, but uh, having somebody uh, in the schools with, talking with the teachers. Yeah. But that, that's our, that's one of our, our good contacts. That's a good contact. Sure. Dom, another thought would be invite various nonprofits to be speakers at your club and see if any of them inspire your members. That's a great thought. Kill two birds with one stone, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's right. That goes with working with another organization. Yeah, yeah. partnering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, all right. Holly, go ahead. One thought I had, and I don't know, perhaps it's been done with other clubs, but there's been so much emphasis uh, in the last year or so about how um, law enforcement is addressing issues in the community for which they're poorly trained or less trained to handle. And they may have an on the ground perspective of needs in the community that you may not get from the mayor or a faith community or something just you know, off the top of my head. And I, I don't know that that's been done, but it might be a, a help to that, that group of um, public servants. All of those are good ideas. Every one of them. Hollis, yours is great too. Uh, don't necessarily talk to the chief of police, talk to the uh, various sergeants that, uh, that, that work, at, work the beats. Right. Good idea. Dom? Dom? Yeah. So a uh, question about, you mentioned the mayor. So I'm curious uh, to what degree we either consider or don't consider having a discussion with the mayor in the middle of a political season? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think as, the, 
as the manager for future projects, you are going to have to tread carefully when you're talking to a politician. Uh, they all have their pet or in the water, so to speak. And uh, especially, like you said, during an election season. Uh, you can always you know, give equal time to both sides. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you also got city councilmen you can talk to. Uh, the whole idea is to gather information on the community's needs uh, as opposed to what your club may want to do. Uh, it's like a, a club that decides it wants to build park benches, but what the city needs is a recreational area for the kids. Uh, and, and you wouldn't know that unless you asked around, so to speak. Uh, so don't do it. Don't do it internally when you're working on a project. Do it externally. Then what's the next step after you've got some ideas or got the idea? Either either an individual or a committee really needs to write up a scope of what that project uh, parts are, so that then it could be. Um, evaluated for costs. Okay, so you're, you're talking about uh, putting a plan together? Yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it, nice and clear. Okay. Well, and the project needs a champion too. Okay, so who's gonna run the project, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Dama, yeah, you, you, need a, you need a clear, in or, or what you want as a result of your project. You need that, that to be clearly defined, even when you start, where are we gonna go with this and what do we really want to happen? Right. Then you can plan to that a lot easier. That's, that's right. Uh, and then what, after, you've, after you've put this plan together and know what you want to accomplish and you've got a pretty good idea of how you want to do it, and how you're going to get your club involved. What are you going to do? I think the next thing I would have to do would be um, identify the members for and delegate specific tasks towards the goal of the service project. Okay, put that a different way. You got to get buy-in. Uh, actually, I'm assigning people at this point, but maybe I have to get buy-in first. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea to get buy-in okay <laughs> it might be a little easier to get volunteers after that because it's going to be the club members that do the project right absolutely that this isn't a grant deal where you just write a check or send the money off somewhere <laughs> you got to get the hands on the hands in the dirt so to speak Okay, so we've got, uh, we, we know what we want to do. We've got a pretty good idea of how we're going to do it and what the end result's going to be. And we've got the club saying, okay, let's do it. Uh, what's the next step after that? Anybody? Mike? I thought Mike McNair had something to say, but I guess not. Mike, if you were going to say something, you're on mute. No, sir. I'm just learning. Okay. How about uh, somebody mentioned it earlier, uh, but you're going to have to really get down to putting this thing on paper and putting a pencil to it what's it going to cost and more importantly once you know what it's going to cost where are you going to get the money are you going to get the money out of the club's coffers or are you going to have to have a a fundraiser to back up the project most projects you end up with a fundraiser from my experience uh, I guess I ought to preface that a little bit. I've, I've done a lot of this 
kind of work. I was the foundation chair for the for the district for a few years and worked on it. Saw a lot of club projects. Most of them were grant grants, but a lot of them were done on a local basis. And the grant went to that specific project, uh, which is something you can look at. Uh, they're called the community, it used to be called community grants as a matter of fact. Uh, but one way or the other, you gotta have the money to do the project. If it's gonna be a success, that needs the financial support of the club. You can maybe integrate the fundraising as part of the event. For example, we have, we sponsor a 4th of July parade every year. We started selling programs. So that's, it's both a community event and a fundraiser together. That's a great idea, Jesse. Um, Rio, Rio Rancho did some projects that way, as a matter of fact. Uh, I can uh, I can recall a flag project that they did. Um, anything else? Any other ideas? Uh oh, you're gonna do projects. You gotta have ideas. Come on. How are you going to get the club membership involved? I you like Donna's, Donna's idea. You just tell them. This is what we're you doing. Just tell <laughs> we, we, we have a person in our club who's called the shamer. Oh, God. <laughs> you better be there. You know, also, you have to realize that probably maybe on a third of your club is in on that project. A third may be something else they like to do. So you kind of got to judge this and, and have some alternatives for your members to be involved too. Uh, not everybody wants to do that, and, and but they want to do something else. So right. uh, again, in getting your people there, you, you have to know as a leader, the ones that are really going to be involved with you. The other ones may support it, but not won't be directly involved. Yeah, yeah, that's true. My belief too is, you don't just ask the club in a blanket statement. You've got to talk to people personally. Absolutely. Talk to them one by one and say, we'd yeah. really like you to do this. I think well, going back to an earlier part of today, we talk about inviting people, you know, and that, you know, part of us were invited to our first Rotary Club and, and the invitation is you know, I think if you have a good rapport with your club members, they're going to say, well, not my thing. But it, just being honored to be invited uh, encourages a lot of excitement and, and participation. True. That's very true. And it's a little more difficult for somebody to say no when you're standing right in front of them. <laughs> uh, also when you're talking to people and asking them things, if you give them a general, so you want to work on this project, sometimes you need to be very specific. Could you do this for us? A very specific task. Well, and then yeah. they, that person knows more how to answer you. Yeah, especially if it's something that you know is up their alley. Like a, like a, like a, maybe a, an accountant that you're going to ask to, kind of keep track of the funds during the project's development and execution. How about how much time is the project going to take? Any thoughts on that? But you want to be specific when you ask people to do a service project uh, so they'll have some idea how long it's going to take. It may, yeah. And make it easier for them to say yes or no. And how much, how much time you expect them to allocate to that project. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which goes back to this planning thing that we talked about. We just kind of glossed over. Planning a project is, is the heart of a successful 
project. Well-planned projects are usually the ones that are well executed and most successful. And if you wanna to put together a commu committee to help you with that planning, don't be afraid to do that. Uh, you don't have to do this. You don't have to take this on by yourself. In fact, uh, I, I like the idea of using a small community, a small committee rather, to, uh, to plan a project. You got uh, eight, 10 ears and eyes to, uh, to come up with the, the plan and look it over in detail. Uh, and uh, I guarantee you the execution will be a lot simpler. And it's a lot easier to describe it when you go to sell it to every, somebody else. Plus you need different skills to run a project. You want That's somebody to manage the money, somebody to be able to press and advertise, somebody else to manage logistics and volunteers, they have a van. Right. Yeah. So you need skills, different skills. What else is important? How about the success of the project being another point that is Rotary's involvement in the community, being able to promote it and being able to publicize it? Pretty important, huh? You don't just want to do this in a vacuum. You want everybody to know that it's a rotary project. Maybe it's the kind of project that at the end of it, you can plant a sign in front of it that says it was done by the Rotary Club of XYZ. Okay, if you're if you're cleaning a cactus garden, how are you going to tell the people that it's the Rotary Club of Socorro? Oh, we're all going to be wearing our Rotary vest, our shirts, yes. and and the uh, editor of the uh, El Defensor Chieftain is a Rotarian now, so I will be working with her to get an article in the paper. Well, congratulations that you've got a newspaper person on, in your club. Uh, there is a reluctance these days for uh, people in the newspaper, as an example, to get involved in the Rotary Club because they're concerned that they're going to be accused of bias. Uh, Plus, used to be, people are a dying breed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it used to be a privilege to have an editor of the newspaper yeah. in your club. Uh, those days are gone. So congratulations, John, for being able to do that. We actually have a, one of our judges who contacts the newspaper and they don't want him to get mad at him. <laughs> okay. I may suggest that also on your service projects that you do all kinds because you, you've got some members who are, are older who can't you know, physically do something, but they can, there are other things that they can do. They so can help you raise money, right? Well, they'll raise money or they may, there may be some service project where they can sit down and, and, and see about getting people for your Dolly Parton imagination library or or something else uh, try to create projects where everybody can be involved maybe a literary of... program with the kiddos yeah 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 that's a good point my club may be a real good example of that <laughs> okay also also um take a lot of pictures of people actually doing the work, not uh, standing behind trash, trash bins or in front of trucks or, you know, actually doing the work and then uh, share that with, with the club and, and the district and everybody. Get it on Facebook, take pic action photos. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. 
wouldn't hurt to send a picture or two to the newspaper either. Yeah. All right. Well, one of the other things that you that you talked about and uh, or at least hinted about is how does this fit in with the other activities of your club? Any of you have comments on that? Well, after the project, you can always have a social activity. You know, we plan to go get some green chili cheeseburgers after we've weeded. Uh huh. Make it a big enough event that you invite the district governor to be part of it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Bob will be there. I'll be taking the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think uh, I think we've kind of covered everything you need to do to uh, develop a good project. Tom? Uh, yeah. One more thing. Um, these are the best recruiting tools we have, not, not, not lunches, a, but service projects. Bob, Bob, that's an excellent point. Yeah, get people involved. Get them to bring other people that might be interested in joining the club or people that you think you could get interested in joining the club if you could get them to participate in the project. Great idea. Good thought. Okay. Bob, Bob no event is too small for a district governor. Isn't that correct? That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to be careful, uh, and this is just my personal comment, about confusing the fundraising part with the project. Sure. Don't let the fundraising become the project. Remember what your, what your final goal is, that you need the money to do whatever it is you came up with. Do we have any other comments with reference to this? Um, Again. One, one more thing, Don. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if this could be covered later, but uh, you know, our, our president, Shaker Maida, has asked us to do Rotary Days of Service this year, where we do joint projects with clubs. Oh, that's a good we, point. We get two or, two or more clubs to, to focus on one, and they can do multiple, you know, we can, you know, uh, you know, one club joins another club on their project and then they, uh, they work on the other club's project with them. So we can get more, uh, you know, focus and have a greater impact by having more people involved through joint projects, not only with clubs, but other civic organizations. Good point. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I've seen this work very well, particularly in the grants area where you had multiple clubs working on a large community project that benefited all of the clubs, uh, communities, once it was done. A uh, good example was in Socorro, as I recall, where we had, uh, I think three or four clubs involved in a singular project that was extremely successful. Uh, and these can be done without the grant necessarily uh, maybe you do the joint fundraising and then you do the joint project. Again, depends on what, what the needs are and what your clubs can, club or clubs can accomplish. All right. Well, that's it. Not going to belabor the point, uh, but, uh, you know, prior planning prevents poor performance. That's usually the way it works. Clean that up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I'm finishing up a little early, but I don't think that'll hurt. Well, thank you very much. I'll turn it back to you, Jeff. Awesome, Dom. Thank you. All right. And the crescendo that we talked about when we started today is, is now happening with past district governor, Tom Lindsay. 
Well, I want to thank everybody for hanging in there. It's a long day. Uh, we're going to talk about engaging members. I have a theory if every club would add one project in this district to their day, their club, we wouldn't need a membership chair if they're engaged in doing things. People are going to line up and want to join Rotary. And that's the, our engaging members is going to be a way we keep members in our club and keep them involved. I'm going to give you an example of how engaged are you? There's a survey given uh, the first handout on this session. Could you really fill out that survey? Do you have enough knowledge to? It has a lot of questions on there. And if you can thoroughly fill it out accurately and, and with good information, it's great. But unfortunately, uh, I have a feeling a large number of our members couldn't answer a lot of those questions because they don't know enough about their club or the district. It's not their fault. And that's what I want to bring up is knowledge. Knowledge is power with our club members. The more knowledge they have about Rotary, the more likely they are to remain with us uh, because they know about Rotary. Uh, it's like if, if you join a club, you kind of know, need to know the rules, don't you? Uh, what, what the club does, uh, the scope of the club. Uh, I'm gonna join a service club. Do they do everything in the community? Do they serve every need or, or whatever, you know? So uh, if you have a job, you get hired, you need to know the rules of that job. Who do you talk to? Uh, how do you make change? Uh, how do you accomplish your job? So knowledge is very important and most big companies have orientations to let you know. If you have a problem, you talk to this person, you go here, do this, uh, ways to fill out forms, <laughs> whatever you have to do. Uh, it doesn't matter what organization you're in, that's important. So Rotary becomes very important because it's a volunteer group. Uh, you need to know what's going on. When I first joined Rotary, we certainly didn't have an orientation. Uh, I had a, a natural tendency to read and, and learn, and that's how I did it. But I can tell you probably half our club members uh, don't have that inclination. They want to serve and do good things, but somehow we need to orient them to the club. And so what I want you to do, we're, we're going to break out into some groups. And I want to ask you to look at one thing is, what would you include in an orientation? And I want you to look at how long, or how much time is taken for orientation, the content. Do you just talk about your club? Do you talk about Rotary District, Rotary International, uh, how your club runs their meetings, uh, organization? What do you do and what do you actually tell a new member? Without, without overwhelming them. You know, too much information sometimes can create issues too. And uh, as everybody knows, the, the, the website on Rotary is literally tens of thousands of pages. <laughs> so what do you pick out to tell those new members? And so that's what I want you to break out and determine what you're going to do in your orientation for a new member or any member actually, <laughs> uh, if they want to do it. So I'd like to go out to for about a 10 minute breakout group for that. Okay, so um, we have two rooms set up. Bruce, are you okay facilitating one of them? Uh, Jesse, are you okay with the other? Okay, and Tom, you can float back and forth between the two. That'd be fine. So 10 minutes, here we go. Hello. Bruce, you're, Bruce, you're mute. There we go. Now I'm not. Um, so, okay, everybody understand the task. What we want to look at is, okay, you, you, you're the, uh, let's see, because I actually had a chance to do this in my club, uh, to create an orientation program. Uh, I was, uh, at that time, I was teaching a course overseas for the State Department. I got an email from our new club president and it said, uh, I need you to create an orientation program for our new members. And uh, luckily I had a copy of the, uh, I had a copy of the, uh, the latest uh, 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 Rotary magazine. And there was uh, uh, the history of Rotary in there just about. And I, that was a big help. So what do you think? 
I need to know from you, and I'll be, I'll be the, uh, the, the scribe here. What will you do? What, okay, got new members coming in. You're in charge. What do you want them to do? What do you want to give them? What kind of information do you think our new members need? Bianca. I think one of the first things is maybe a breakdown of the finances. I heard somebody say earlier that they, you know, they paid the club money, but they're not exactly sure what that's for. So you're talking about dues. The dues specifically, yes. Okay. In other words, yeah. What are they going to be used for? What are, right. And that's not necessarily the most important, but that's the first one that popped in. Okay. I, I have, I have a, an idea. Um, if you have a new member, you also have the potential of losing a new member. So I'm thinking there must be some data about what retention, why do members stay? And if you can hone in on what those things are that are going to be touchstones for a new member, that might keep them engaged when you before you get into all the weeds, which you will, you know, inevitably do by the history and expectations. But, you know, what's going to retain somebody? Um, and so, and I don't know what that is. But and along with that is why do they leave? And are you guys familiar with it, with the numbers there? You know, of the new members that come in, half of them are gone within three years. Three years. Yeah. Half. That's one of the things that Rotary is trying to fix. Um, but so far, well, we haven't been too good at it. Okay. But, you know, you know, what, what, what it's not a kind of a question you want to ask. You got to assume or you've got to think ahead, think, you know, what, you know, what can we do to make them stay? And you can ask them, well, you know, why, why'd you join? You know, what was the reason that you joined? What do you want to get out of Rotary? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And if friendship is a real important component to cohesion for the club, then, you know, any device for that onboarding that'll begin new friendships, you know, whether that's, you know, uh, expanding out your sponsorship duties or, or what have you, because I think you, um, I myself am not uh, of the Jewish faith, but I'm from a blended family and those that are educators say that they always start their class with a little bit of honey. Um, and because learning should be sweet. So same thing, you are new members, learning should be sweet.